Hi everyone, Sif Optimist here. Thank you very much for your subscriptions, for your comments, for your likes. It truly means a lot to me. I want to remind you that I offer personal readings, customized sigils, spells, and many other services at sifalchemist.com. I have a variety of sigils specific for different purposes. So you can find everything at sifalchemist.com, link in the description box below. It's the only place where I offer my services and nowhere else. Today, I wanna to talk about Greek mythology and the Greek gods and how to work with them. The Greek gods or Greek mythology, it is something that is real. Modern day archeologists and scientists like to call it mythology, but the amount of evidence and proof that these beings have existed is just fascinating. It's hard to ignore, it's hard to dismiss. These beings or gods, they were in control at some point. They lived on earth and they were the kings, the queens, the rulers of that era. We're talking about thousands of years ago. And especially before the flood, the flood of Noah, some call it the flood of Atlantis. Before that flood, these gods, they were prominent. They were ruling the earth and they were very, very powerful. And you might wonder, well, it is still mythology because that's what they taught us when we were young at school. Because at school, they teach that that's mythology. And since they teach it at school, you get programmed to believe for the rest of your life that that's what it is, whatever they teach you at that age. Because even speaking from a science and biology standpoint, from zero to seven year old, you can program the kid to believe anything you want. Anything. You can make them believe that they can change the color of their eyes if they want to at will, and they will believe it, or that they were gonna grow a limb if they want to, and they will believe it. They are programmable, they are malleable, they are easy to influence from zero to seven years old. So when you go to school and study that this is mythology, for you it's gonna be mythology till the rest of your life. Same for religion, same for anything that you're taught when you're young. And that's why some people, they stop growing at age seven. You might learn more things here and there until you hit your 20s, but some people, whatever they believe is what they used to believe when they were six and seven years old. So Greek mythology is taught to the world to be mythology, but it's not. These gods, these beings, these goddesses existed for thousands of years and there's proof of it everywhere. You're gonna ask me, where is the proof? Where is this concrete proof? Well, in addition to all the history and the story and the epics that have been written, for example, by Homer, it's even where the word Odyssey comes from and you use it in your daily life, Odyssey, and it came from a myth about a guy called Odysseus. And then the amount of details which Homer depicted the stories of ancient Greece is just fascinating. It's too many details to, to think that this was just a story. And I'm not gonna even elaborate on the stories and the epics that were written in history. I'll let you read that or, or research it on your own because it's quite fascinating. I'm just gonna go to events and little things that are prominent in this day and age as a proof, as a sign that these gods existed. They were not mythology. As an alchemist, I know the power of symbology, the power of sigils, the power of taking a certain symbol or number, numerology, symbology, and putting a message in it and making it live for eternity. But only the masters know this. 
Only the initiates know such a thing. They know that symbology and naming things a certain way and putting numbers on certain things a certain way is what's going to survive no matter what happens. You can put it in books, they're going to get burned. You can put it in computer databases. If electricity goes away, they're going to go away. But when you put things in symbols, they never die. These symbols will exist. Their meaning gets distorted over time, but the main message, the main information stays there. That's why secret societies throughout the ages made sure to embed the knowledge, the wisdom within symbols, within numbers, within drawings, similarly to alchemy and Kabbalah. If you check alchemy, for example, and Kabbalah and other Hindu practices, you're just going to find symbols and words and numbers. That's all you're going to find. You're not going to find texts or books, you know. The emerald tablet, which is the basis of alchemy, it's the foundation of alchemy uh, and modern occultism even, if you will, it's only one page, it's one tablet, one page is the foundation of alchemy and hermeticism. And that's why it's called the Emerald Tablet. It was written by Hermes Trismegistus or Thoth, the god of wisdom in ancient Egypt, and it's one page. It's not a book, it's not 100 or 500 pages. In fact, the more I find books that have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of explaining something, the more I know there's nothing there. The highest form of sophistication is simplicity. It's making things simple and easy to understand in one word, one sentence, one symbol, one number. We have, for example, to go back to the Greek story, we have the Olympic Games. It's a worldwide event that's still held every four years. Now, I'm speaking right now. This is not a myth. It's called the Olympic Games. Where do you think the Greek gods resided? Mount Olympus was the house of the Greek gods. It's where they used to live. It's where Zeus used to live. And humans, to honor the gods, made the Olympic Games. If this was a myth, why do we still call it the Olympic Games in 2023? Now, why do we still call it the Olympic Games? We can call it anything else. No, but we're going to call it the Olympic Games as an honor, as a respect for these gods that have existed. And the people in power, the people in control know this. And that's why they keep the names as they are. And they don't change them because they have manuscripts, they have books, they have libraries that prove even more than what we have that these gods, these beings existed on earth. We have the Olympic Games, we have, if you take the bill of the euro, the currency of Europe, it's the currency of one whole continent. If you take the currency, the euro, which is named after Europe, which is named after a Greek goddess, Europa. Yes, a whole continent is named after a Greek goddess called Europa. She was the wife of Zeus. He abducted her and he brought her to the island of Crete where he had three sons with her. One of their sons is called Minos, King Minos, the founder of the Minoan civilization, where the legend of the Minotaur comes from. And it's not even a legend, it's real. I have a video that talks about the Minoans and the Minotaur. You can watch it on this channel. But Europa, Europe, a Greek goddess. You think if this was a myth, it would, they would name a whole continent after it? Not only that, in the currency, the euro, they have her face there. Take any euro bill, you will find the face of Europa, the Greek goddess, the wife of Zeus. 
So you still think it's mythology? Really? What about these brands that you wear in your daily life? Nike. Who do you think that is? Another brand. Hermès, which is Hermes. Venus. Pandora. All of these names, they're the name of gods and goddesses, Greek god and Greek goddesses. And to honor them, they keep them alive throughout history using their names. Athens in Greece, the capital of a whole country, of a whole country, is named after a Greek goddess? Really? You really think it's mythology? Like, start using your mind. Wake up. So use your mind. Be smart. Be intelligent. Use this gift that was given to you. Use it to analyze what you see in front of you without being influenced by anyone. Oh, they teach us it's, it, it's mythology. It's a myth. Yeah, it's a myth, but there's the capital city that's called Athens after the goddess Athena. Oh, but it's a myth. Okay. What about all these temples that were built in ancient times for the, for the Greek gods and goddesses? Why would you build a temple that takes so much time and years to build and so much architecture and science and math and so much manpower and energy and resources? Why would you do so for an imaginary being that's not real? You really think it's they were not real? You will build mesmerizing temples all over Greece, in Italy, if you go to Egypt as well, and you find these magnificent temples that would make you stop everything you're doing just to look at them, and you think they were done for imaginary myths? These gods were real. They were not myths. I'm gonna give you an example to clarify. Take, for example, the lion. We're not even going to take a person. We're going to take a lion. A lion 500 years from now, let's say, is going to be extinct. It's not going to exist anymore. The numbers of the lions are decreasing every single year. And let's imagine 500 years from now, they're probably going to be extinct. That's just the truth. It's the reality. I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything here. 500 years from now, when lions are going to be extinct and they're going to exist only in pictures on the internet and in books, you think people are still going to believe in them like now when they can actually see them in safaris and zoos or whatnot? Well, you're going to tell me, well, we have evidence, we have the footage, we have videos that show that they existed. Yes. So maybe people are going to believe that they have existed because of, because of the footage, but in ancient times, there was no footage, so let's say that we don't have the technology to film these lines. We don't have cameras. What's going to happen 500 years after they become extinct? People are going to start to believe that they're myths and legends. Similarly to dragons. Dragons used to exist all around the world, but they became extinct and now they are just a myth but they have existed. And that's why in ancient books, in all over the world, in China, in Mesoamerica, in India, in Arabia, you find drawings of dragons everywhere. People were not that stupid to just draw something they imagined in their head. If anything, people were not that smart. They were smart, but not but to a certain extent. So they had to draw what they saw. So they were drawing what they were seeing. And the only evidence we have left is these drawings, either on paper or in scripts or in walls or in temples, because dragons existed, but now they are a legend. Lions will become a legend. They will become a legend 500 years from now, 1000 years from now. Unless technology persists and stays alive, and maybe with the footage that we have from this era, if that footage survives five to 1,000 years from now, then maybe people are gonna believe that they were not myths or legends. So the same goes for 
the Greek gods. These gods existed, they were real. There's evidence of their existence all around you every single day. Actually share with me in the comment section other evidence, either through names or through symbols that you might know, um, because I'm not saying everything in this video here. This is just to give you an idea on why they were real. And we can even connect the story of the Greek gods, for example, with what's written in the Bible, or with the story of the Anunnaki. Some call them the fallen angels. Some call them um, the Nephilim, like Hercules. He was a Nephilim because he was half God. The Nephilim were the kids of gods who mated with humans. In the Bible, they're called the fallen angels. And they gave birth to these super strong, tall beings. Hercules is one of them. If you start connecting the dots, you're gonna find out that they are the same beings. The Anunnaki, they were here to teach humans how to live and how to do certain things in life. The same as the Greek gods, they were teaching humans how to live. Although the Greek gods were ruthless because they did a lot of killing and raping and suffering. And it's all written in these epics, in these stories that are myths. They did a, they were not, you know, I think they cared for humans, but at the same time, they were very ruthless. So how to work with these deities, how to work with them, how to work with their spirit? Are they still alive? Do they still exist now? That I'm not sure about. And if they do, maybe they are hiding somewhere or they have the technology to hide from us or they have the magic to hide from us. But how to work with their spirit? First, start by researching the deity. Try to find anything you can on the Greek gods, on Zeus, on Poseidon, on Hades, on anyone you would like to work with, on Artemis. She was a powerful, powerful goddess, Artemis. I'm talking about the version of Artemis that's like the Greek version of Artemis. I have in one of my videos, uh, me and Ina, which we visit the temple of Artemis, one of the ancient wonder of the world. Um, you can see more details about the temple of Artemis there because I think um, there's two different depictions of Artemis. One of her is like looking like a human holding a, a bow and arrow um, and, and she has a deer beside her and they say she's the goddess of love and hunt and feminine energy. But I'm talking about the Artemis that used to be worshipped thousands and thousands of years ago in the temple of Artemis. She was one of the main goddesses of ancient time. People used to pilgrim from around the world to worship her. And her temple was one of the ancient wonders of the world. I think the goddess of the highest divine feminine energy is Artemis. So if you want to connect with these deities, try to research anything you can find about them. Try to visit their temples around the world. That's what I do myself and Ina, which we go and visit these sites and these temples where these gods and goddesses were worshipped. And we try to see what we can find, information, how to, intuition, what do we feel when we're there? Because by visiting these temples, you can remember information from previous lives, something you used to practice in your previous life and you forgot about it, but you might be able to remember it when you visit. Or read books. You have the internet, try to find any information you can. For example, Poseidon, everyone knows that he was the god of water and the oceans. Then use in your rituals to invoke his spirit, use water. Use the water element to invoke him because he used to rule over Atlantis. He created Atlantis. He used to rule over the oceans. Use water or go to a body of water and do your ritual there. Try to connect with him through water. If it's Hades, we know he ruled over the underworld and darkness. So try to go to caves or try to do a ritual when it's completely dark. I have a couple candles lit up and make sure it's completely dark to invoke his spirit. And you can do the same for these other deities. For example, for Artemis, she's the goddess of the divine feminine. Try to 
In your rituals, give her some offerings such as roses and flowers and anything that's beautiful and pleasing to the eye because she doesn't like men, but she likes beauty and beautiful things. So what are you going to offer to her in order to invoke her spirit? So try to always connect the dots. These gods and these goddesses were known for specific things. What were they known for? Take it and use it in your ritual. Use it in your invocation. Sometimes using a sigil can help as well, or a spell to fortify the invocation. I myself have many sigils at sephalchemist.com that I channel myself because I'm a sigilist. And these sigils are encoded with energy that can help and speed up the invocation. Because you might not know where to start. You're like, I want to invoke, for example, Poseidon, but I, I have no idea how to do it. Using a sigil or a spell or using something that can aid you in invoking the spirit is highly recommended. Like what I mentioned with Poseidon, it's water. Go, it's going to be easier to invoke him when you're near water versus if you're inland. Try to see the guidance that comes your way for invoking that specific deity. But the good thing with the Greek gods is that we have a lot of information about them through mythology. And you know what? Maybe it is a blessing in disguise. Maybe I'm glad that they call it mythology. Because if they did not call it mythology, maybe all of those stories would have been gone and destroyed and annihilated by religion. Because one way to make something survive throughout history and time, similarly to tarot and alchemy, is to embed it into something that's not serious. So, embedding these realities and these beings and these gods that have existed in myths and stories is the best way to make them survive for eternity. The same for tarot, that knowledge is embedded in a card game. It's a card game, but it's full of knowledge and that's why it has survived. Similarly to alchemy, it's a lot of symbols, it's a lot of sigils, but it has survived. We still have it right now. We still study it, we still learn it, because embedding knowledge and truth in something that's kind of a gimmick, like a story or a card game or a myth, makes it more durable because if people were to say this is true this is 100 percent the truth then all of these other dogmas and systems such as religious groups will go after it and try to annihilate it as much as they can this is even the reason why magic and witchcraft unfortunately is attacked and fought even until this day and age because unfortunately in monotheistic religions and all other religions around the world magic and, witch and witchcraft are believed to be real and you have many people and groups throughout history going after these magnificent gifted individuals witches and alchemists and practitioners they go after them and try to kill them try to get rid of them try to burn them in this day and age we have it with in social media you know we have these mass reports these mass attacks trying to bring all of the accounts of practitioners down so it's really unfortunate because religions know that this is real and it's very powerful but i wish it was hidden in some sort of game or some sort of story similarly to the greek gods and because, for example, alchemy is hidden in a bunch of symbols that no one can decipher unless you're the initiate, unless you do your research, then you can decipher them. So these gods, the Greek gods, and not only the Greek gods, all of them, the Greek, the Egyptian, the Mesopotamian, the Mesoamerican, the Hindu gods, all of them were real and they have existed. So I hope this helps. Let me know in the comment section what do you think about these gods? And if you work with any of these gods or with their spirits, let me know. Thank you again. And I will see you in the next video.